Hey guys, welcome to our animation podcast. This is uh, Shiyun Kim. Uh, and this is Min-Kyu Lee, and uh, this is Min-Kyu and Shiyun, an animation podcast. And this is just a podcast where we just sit and talk about animation. So before we go into this episode, we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of introduce ourselves and tell you guys who we are. Um, so I want to introduce to you guys my co-host Shiyun Kim. Shun Kim is an award-winning character designer, visual development artist, and animator whose past credits include Disney's Tangled, Frozen, Big Hero 6, and Zootopia, which he was the leading character designer for. He won an Annie Award for Best Character Design for his work on Sony's highly acclaimed Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. After Sony, he went back to work at Disney on an unannounced project and is currently working at Netflix on another unannounced project. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife, animation story artist Chihan Park, my good friend, and their daughter Chloe, and their Jindo dog Toadie. I also want to introduce my good friend and co-host Mingyu Lee, who's an amazing director, animator, whose past credits include Disney's Princess and the Frog, Frozen, Wreck-It Ralph, and Moana. He also animated a fantastic animated short called Adam and Dog. Definitely try to watch that. It was nominated for an Oscar um, for a Best Animated Short. And it also won the Annie for the same category. He most recently worked on Glenn Keane's Over the Moon and is also working on Top Secret stuff at Netflix. <laughs> he lives in Los Angeles with his shepherd mix, Toby. Oh, wait, so I actually have a question for you, Shun. Um, you know, reading... Nothing personal, by the way. Nothing personal. <laughs> Well, if it's personal, we can edit it out. But, um, you know, you have this really illustrious career in character design and visual development. Have you ever wanted to try um, your hand at other stuff in animation outside of visual development? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I just wish I was good at it. Which you are. <laughs> paid for it. You're amazing. probably amazing um, at it. But, I, you know, I love hand-drawn animation, and um, I also love storyboarding, Uh I got a chance to do that uh, working on Glenn's uh, right, film, yeah. Over the Moon. Um, and they look, they look fantastic. They're, I they're really terrible. hope the <laughs> listeners one day will eventually get to see them because they look so good. But it was like a really cool experience, and I'd just love to do that more. I also know a little bit about Mingyu, too. And um, Uh-oh. he also has a deep love for insects. Yeah. Um, I remember he used to have a prank. A couple different praying mantises. Several, several. Several different <laughs> ones. Um, so is there like a favorite insect that is your favorite or a couple different ones that? Yeah, um, I mean, probably praying mantises. Praying mantises. Yeah, I think. Which one in particular? Well, um, and you can, you guys can look this up on the internet if you want because it's really, well, I'll, I'll give you a couple or several to look up on the internet if you want because <laughs> they're just so fascinating um type in toxodera mantis online on google or something that's uh one species of mantis that i think lives in malaysia that is just out of this world incredible looking um very very rare it's it's like the forest god of mantises um toxodera t-o-x-o-d-e-r-a uh another one you guys can uh look up is uh Idolo Mantis Diabolica. That's another incredible. Diabolica. Yeah. That sounds it's, dramatic. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> the common name is the, the Devil's Flower Mantis, but it, I mean, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous mantis. Really, really incredible. So, um, you guys are listening to our very first podcast, and to all the listeners, uh, thank you so much for being here and listening to what we have to say. Uh, on this episode, we talk a little bit about, why we wanted to start a podcast, um, our motivations behind it, I guess. and Also, just for selfish reasons, uh, to even <laughs> ask questions like I've been wondering about, um, which is like, how? What, what was your first memory of just drawing? Because a lot of people in animation That's love drawing question, and yeah. art. Um, and I think it's so interesting to hear like what their first memory of drawing was. And also just like your first experience animating something, I think, that's always very like illuminating for me just like how that was how did that feel yeah it's a it's a big moment for every animator i think for everyone to see their drawings or model 
come to life for the yeah. first time. Yeah. And since we both went to CalArts, also, you know, we went through animation school. We been through a couple internships we're and one that, students and now we're professionals and right. it's a different world <laughs> and so maybe if there's anything like for those that are you know curious about animation they're a student or they're thinking like oh is this something that might be like something i'd want to do um maybe there's some things that we could kind of talk about that could be inspirational helpful yeah um, totally so stay tuned at the end of the episode. We're going to tell you guys ways that you guys can get involved in this podcast and because we really want to create a dialogue with this podcast and we want to hear what you guys want to talk about or if there's anything that's on your mind, any struggles as an artist that you guys want us to discuss with our guests. Um, you we're going to ideas for future podcast episodes. That would be great. Uh, we really want to hear Absolutely. what's going on right now. Uh, with you guys as well so stay tuned uh towards the end of the episode um to learn how to get involved and uh yeah enjoy the episode you guys <laughs> we can't talk about you <laughs> um anyway so i feel like for our listeners we should talk about why we're sitting here recording this podcast why we're doing this um i feel like one of the reasons why I wanted to do it was because because we talk a lot and we converse a lot. And during our conversations, I felt like Shiyun has shared so many rich ideas and thoughts about animation and art in general that I feel like maybe, maybe podcasting might be the best outlet for. Because what I really like about podcasting is that it's a more like conversational format as opposed to like what, what are some of the other formats, you know, like Twitter, which right. I think is great for some things, but when really trying to discuss more nuanced, um, uh, varied complex issues may not be the best for just because, you know, we have that word limit and it's not really, um, a platform that is suited for dialogue right you know long conversations and then i was thinking about like or like blogs or books seem right. also a little bit more one-sided but i i just think there is something really fun and refreshing about like the like having a conversation about it having yeah. a dialogue about it rather than just kind of like projecting out to the world what you think about right um, and, 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 and there's so much things that like I feel like that isn't being talked about. Yes. And a lot of other animation podcasts mm -hmm. are, are on in media that I'm like, oh, hey, maybe we could make up our own podcast and talk about those things. And maybe other people would also be like curious and interested in it. Totally. Um, yeah. Because I think every all the other animation geared podcasts or, or not podcasts, but just like um, videos or interviews tend to be just more about, okay, what's your process and what's your background, which is great. And right. I love hearing that too. But also like I've noticed, especially when we're hanging out or when I'm hanging out with some of my other animation friends, we like talking about kind of the bigger ideas in animation and the general movement of like, where is animation headed, right. you know, and what are the current trends of animation that's happening right now? And um, can we dissect it and what does it mean? And um, is there, are there more um, interesting opinions about just what's happening in, in animation as a culture, right. you know, that can be expressed? All right. Yeah. And, and it's also possible for, for the listeners too. Like um, we're, we're going to try to make it so that <laughs> they can, you know, take part in the conversation somehow and we could yep. uh, listen to them and, uh, figure out what they want to hear from an animation podcast as well. By the way, can I just mention Donna's bird really quick? Oh, okay. did, did, did the bird get picked? Okay, so um, we're recording at Andy and Donna's apartment. By the way, Andy's our producer, um, and he's the main reason why we're all sitting here being able to <laughs> record. Yes. So thank you so much, thank Andy. You, Andy. Thank you also to Jihan and Donna, whose um, help has been so instrumental to this podcast. But if you hear a little beep, so that's uh, Donna's uh, parrot, Cooper. So we addressed what makes you want to do this podcast. Um, the next question is, 
what was your earliest memory of drawing? So that was my question. Yes. And part of the podcast is me being able to ask Mingyu questions too. <laughs> so this is kind of selfish because I kind of just want to know, like, what was your what was your earliest memory of drawing? Because I feel like everyone's got their everyone who does animation. I feel like they, you know, they have their interest in art and. But I feel like everyone's first memory of drawing could be mm-hmm. is very different, and yeah. I I just wanted to know like oh what was your your first memory of picking up a pencil and then drawing something? Um, it's a little bit blurry, but what I do remember is when I was maybe like three or four years old, maybe, and right after I moved to America to Madison, Wisconsin, um, I really liked drawing colorful animals i I remember i really like drawing sharks i really loved drawing parrots Mm. um are they are they called macaws donna yeah Yeah. like macaw is that Mm. how you macaw Macaw? Macaw? okay macaw macaw Macaw. i don't even know um because in my picture book it was just parrot but like i loved how colorful like the red and the blue and the yellow Mm. uh i remember drawing that a lot i also remember um when I was really, really young, I wanted like a shark as a pet. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. Uh, yeah. And, and, but you know, you can't buy a shark as a pet. So I remember, um, my mom bought me a little, uh, fish tank, like a tiny, like round fish tank. And mm-hmm. I drew like a little shark and I put it in there and I was like, oh, this is my pet shark. I, that's like one of my first. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Shun? I used to live in New Jersey, um, and my my dad used to have uh, this printing paper that was like these dots on the sides. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you would kind of attach the dots, and it would print out the paper that way. Yeah, <laughs> really old. I school. know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about. Yeah, and all the paper was like interconnected. Mm-hmm. So um, my dad would get like sheets of these things, mm-hmm. and so when I was a kid. Um, like there wasn't much to do uh yeah. my mom didn't really encourage like watching tv and stuff like that yeah. so um i just had this like paper and i would just like unroll the thing yeah <laughs> and it just felt like this endless infinite white space that you could just keep drawing stuff you were drawing on a scroll it was, instead it was of like, like just one piece of paper <laughs> you know, that's crazy because i have the same i have a very similar memory too because my dad went to uh, madison wisconsin right. uh to get his master's degree i think and and so he and he was studying i think mechanical engineering i'm not sure uh and he and that's the same he would get these like rolls of like i think they're paper. like fax paper or something right, right. Not, maybe yeah. not fax paper <laughs> but like these rolls with like the punches on the side and and yeah i remember drawing all over like his important notes and stuff like that. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Did you ever do the thing? Because um, me and my sister, we used to... Um, so so you get that, that roll of paper, mm-hmm. and then you get, like, two cardboard rolls, mm-hmm. and then you can, like, kind of make your own TV set. Wow. I never did. That's so <laughs> creative. Really I did that. not do that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That came later, like, after yeah. the drawings, but it was like, oh, you can actually... We can make our own TV set, cut a hole in a box, right? Wow. Cardboard box. You get like that toilet paper or these rolls on the side, yeah, and then you can kind of roll That's through the incredible. Thing. Wow! <laughs> so that was I don't know, we'd do stuff like that. That, that would be an amazing <laughs> project for like preschool kids or like kids in first grade or something. Now that'd be that. awesome. Yeah, I think we were really bored. I think it was just like the boredom went to like. And then the drawing kind of went into this space of like, oh, well, you kind of get lost. Some people say it. boredom is good for creativity. Yeah. So, yeah. That's cool. That's a really, that's a really interesting. Yeah, thing. that's uh, very cute memories. <laughs> so, so that makes me wonder. So y- you never animated before you went to CalArts? No. Was that the f- first time Yes. you ever animated anything? Yes, that was the first time I ever animated something and then shot it. And then actually like got to play it back because I think before then right. I did animation a little bit on the side, but I but because I have no way of like scanning it or shooting it and to oh. actually seeing it, oh, it was okay. literally just like, well, here's a thing I'll, I animated. I'll I'll never see how what huh. it looks like, how it moves, but 
here it is. But I think once I got to CalArts, it was the first time I actually really got to see it. And so you were in Mike Wing's class. Yes, I was my first year animation teacher. And my first memory of animating anything was we had a um, head turn assignment, which was which is a really, really good assignment. And when I taught at CalArts, that was the first assignment I gave my students to. But it's, um, it's basically a character reacts to something and turns their head. Mm. And I remember I animated Dorothy from Wizard of Oz reacting to something and turning her head. And I mean, for the listeners out there, like if you've never done hand-drawn animation, I, I just highly, highly encourage you to try because it is the most magical thing to see your drawings actually move mm. and suddenly have life so let's let's slow down like okay so yes. you've never seen animation paper before they have like no. three dots right the peg holes the yes. peg holes yeah so for students it's three dots for professionals it's one two three four five dots five dots okay <laughs> i'm looking at that <laughs> correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah the so, bigger the bigger paper yeah so did um so you put did you know how to put your fingers through no. between the papers mm -mm. when you first did the assignment? No, we had to learn all of that by yourself. So you, yeah. you somehow just saw other people do it. Well, I think Mike Wen kind taught of, us. Like taught he, us. yeah, and and I mean, I still, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I think I have a pretty good hang of it now. But it's, um, yeah, that was the first time. Huh. Yeah. What yeah. about you? Do you remember the first uh, time? My first time. Um, so I did animation at in my high school um, in tenth tenth grade. I went to a summer ROP class before mm -hmm. I went to the high school. What does ROP stand it's, for? So re, uh, regional occupational program. Okay. So it's kind of like uh, a adult school too. So adults can also take oh, animation cool. classes at this high school, and. Um, uh, I just remember doing a bouncing ball. They wouldn't even let us do the head turn thing. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it was terrible. It was really bad. <laughs> but I think uh, when I st when I did it, it w I had this anxiety of, like, wanting to see it. Like, like as I drew it, I was like, I kind of just want to see it, like, and, in and, real time. In right real there. time. Yeah, totally. And, and it just would take forever to you know, I would have to do all the drawings before I actually before yeah. it gets shot. Yeah. Um, so then I started, I noticed like myself like drawing faster towards the, towards the end. And, mm -hmm. and the first two or three drawings were like very like, you know, I was trying to draw it really accurately. But like as as I kept flipping the paper and moving th like forward yeah. like the drawings mm -hmm. got faster and faster well, yeah. i don't know if you did you ever go 100%. through that 100 <laughs> percent. and i mean just from what you just said there it's like there are so many relatable things that you said i i think i can't remember if mike wayne actually gave us um the head turn assignment or the bouncing ball assignment as uh, our first assignment right. I, I feel like it was the head turn assignment and not the bouncing ball i think uh, he just like sure. yeah um, but I think the the second assignment was bouncing ball, and I'm just gonna say something really highly controversial. But man, bouncing ball assignments are so boring. <laughs> and and it's like, look, there there are um, animators out there that are that are like, oh my god, like you have to get the bouncing ball down. Yeah. Like the bouncing ball is like the original. Like it's the first thing everyone has to animate. It's the best thing. It's right. the cleanest thing where you can really understand spacing and and I get it. I agree. Like right. everyone should start with a bouncing ball, but ugh, I did not want to do that assignment. Uh because I just wanted to animate like characters and features. But right. yes, and I also agree with like I remember I distinctly remember when I first animated and every animation teacher tells you to draw rough. Right. Like, just draw rough. Don't think about the. But like my first key pose, I was. It was like an illustration, right? right? You're like you draw everything, <laughs> all the details, and you're like, ah, done. <laughs> it's like a finished drawing, right. and then you're like, okay, next key pose, and then the, the moment you go to the next key pose, you're like, oh, this is why you draw rough because right. your first drawing was all wrong, <laughs> right? Um, but I think that's that's the other like unexpected benefit of. Right doing hand-drawn animation is that it makes it kind of pulls you out of like the very detailed 
a little bit more rigid approach to drawing right. and then it kind of like widens your mind and it makes you uh think of yeah roughs in a different way where you're truly just trying to position all the elements of the right place first mm. like knowing what the blueprint of the drawing is first before going in and adding all the details or you know adding the flesh and all of that so mm. it's there's just so many benefits to i think doing hand-drawn animation did you ever get to this point because for me it took uh, took i still i still don't feel like i kind of reached that point with my animation um but did you ever get to a point where when you pressed play it was all of a sudden it just came to life on its own like mm -hmm. it started mo it started thinking it started reacting and moving and you started believing in your own or did that happen the first time i think it was a mix the first time because it's like when you just never animated before and you animate the f for the first time you have like a clear picture in your head like this is how it's going to move right. and then you do your best to guess the drawings that's going to make it move that way right and then you play it and it's like so many things aren't moving the way that you thought it was going to move right. but then there's that like a little sliver of a thing that's kind of moving the way you thought it would move right and for me because it's like that was the first time i ever saw my drawings move right i think i was just more mesmerized by like wow like my draw this is my drawing and it's like alive um but i think the more i animated especially once i started you know working on princess of the frog and i just had to do a lot of scenes hmm. that gap between like this is how i want it to look and hmm. this is how it looks the first time i shoot it it definitely gets a little bit um smaller hmm. i think yeah hmm. so that's yeah, I mean, practice, there's nothing like practice to, like, make that gap shrink, you know, mm. and repetition. I think that's that's one of the things uh, for students who first start on hand-drawn animation is the most frustrating thing. Mm. Because a lot of times, like, the questions that they ask, the answer is really just, like, you just got to do it over and over again. Did you ever feel like, um, did you ever feel like, when you, like, okay, you, you animate something, you test it on the, on the tester right mm -hmm. and then this uh, this is coming from my personal experience so yes. when i would see which stuff, i'd love to hear yes when i would see my own test yeah on the tester i play it i would already i'd be in my own headspace like there's this weird thing where like i'm i already have an idea of what i want it to look mm -hmm. and, I, and it's totally coming from someone that is making the art but for some weird reason when it came to the producer show or the open show and then all of a sudden your work is on the big yeah. silver screen mm -hmm. and you're in the context of this movie theater where yeah. all your friends and just even people you half don't know the animation industry half the <laughs> which there. was like kind of producer show yeah. are sitting there and they're looking up at this huge screen and giant projection yes a giant projection of your animation drawing animation mm -hmm. did that ever like like, did you ever see it differently? Or was it always yes. the same thing? So, I think 100%. Like, I think for me, every producer show or every time, even like the in the open show, right. when it's uh, my tur my film's turn to play, right. I remember just wanting to shrink into my seat. <laughs> what was your... Did you ever feel like... What, what was your um, experience with oh, having... No, I, I felt that... I felt like all of a sudden... Because, you know, I think when my um, film was, it's like in a collection of other films. So it's yes. in the context of, of your peers. So mm -hmm. I think uh, I had a lot of great art, like people next in my year. There was Penn who, was, who did Amazing. Better of the Bear and I think eventually right. did Adventure so Time. And then JG did like, amazing short film. And But those <laughs> films, you see in the context of that and then yeah. you see their films and there's just this feeling of like, Oh, those those characters are thinking that they're really they feel alive, or mm -hmm. or something about the way the shot selection is, yeah. or the timing is. Yes, you kind of feel like the filmmaker is making you anticipate something. Yeah, and or, all the jokes are landing, and they're landing for like yeah, <laughs> Pen and JG. Pen films. and JG. I yeah. was like, God, it's it's <laughs> landing so well. The 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 reaction in the movie theater was just. Ecstatic. uproarious yeah. yeah i remember yeah and then in the context of that and then and then my short film was just 
I can curse on this podcast. It was <laughs> <Yeah>. shitty. <laughs> yeah. it, it just felt like, oh my gosh, the thing I thought was going to be funny, it just did not land. Or the thing that, like, they just didn't get that one little section of, like, this guy's doing this, but it didn't, like, I was suddenly self aware of other people's yeah uh point of view totally for me was like kind of a big groundbreaking thing for me like learning wise yeah totally i think uh, by the way i do remember seeing your film as a first year (laughs) and uh i I had a role in it Uh, i did the voice oh yes Uh, one of the voices the narrator (laughs) the voice Uh, was awesome yeah no animation was terrible Uh, but but i I do remember seeing it and just being like wowed by every shot i do remember that but but also at the same time i can relate from my personal experience of yeah showing the film I, when when my film was showing i remember like i wasn't even looking at the screen like really? my eyes were shut i was in my seat and all i'm thinking like okay that didn't land that didn't land they didn't get it they didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just oh. um but uh yeah i, I mean it, at the same time, it's such. I think it's such a great learning experience for filmmakers oh, because yeah. it finally contextualizes like how you can envision how your film is going to be shown. Right. Like you're like, oh, so this is really um, what it feels like um, to show it in front of a big audience, and this is what it takes to execute it right. in a level where like the audience is really going to understand it, and that's. Right. That is such a valuable lesson. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like, um, I mean, there might be other schools that do this now too, but CalArts has always kind of done that sort of thing. Yeah. And there's That's pros great. and cons for for everything, but mm-hmm. I think that was the biggest takeaway I got was to show my film in the context of peers Yes. in a uh, a setting that looks like a movie theater. It's like a real movie theater. Yeah. People are really watching it and they're just wanting to enjoy the film. And all of a sudden the drawings are not about the drawings. It's like actually about yeah. like you're watching something and you're actually, you're suspending your uh, disbelief disbelief, mm-hmm. and you're believing the thing that's in front of you is actually alive and moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and a lot of times I feel like other schools don't really have that as much. And it's like, it's hard to get that kind of, it's almost like improv. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, you have an idea of how this thing is going to play. And then yeah, you totally. play it in front of the audience and um, they, it, some things don't land, something's confusing. Mm-hmm. And the thing that like, you're, if you just see it in your own headspace, um, it's, it's going to be a shock when people just don't yeah get it. Totally. no it, it's it's such a valuable lesson and i think what's so great is that i mean i i still do think of those times when i first showed my film like once you kind of have almost that scarring <laughs> experience <laughs> then you can it's actually nice because you can always refer back to that experience and right. be like and it also it actually helps you edit your choices right. when you're making a film or when you're you know um storyboarding something i, right. I think that's why i think for storyboard artists right. like jihan and donna um pitching is also such a great learning experience right. because yeah again you have something you've en- envisioned in your head um sometimes you know some artists can't see it in their head which is really really interesting super valid and something that i think we should talk about mm. in the future of the podcast which but um, for the sake of the argument, let's say that we see something in our head, or at least we know the kind of feeling that we want to communicate to the audience. And right. then you're in front of the director, your fellow storyboard artists, and then you're just like pitching through the scene, you're doing the voices. Right. And sometimes they laugh at things that you didn't, you had no intention of right. making funny. <laughs> and then sometimes they, they're like, huh, okay. At the right. jokes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, they take it in a very intellectual way. Yeah. Like, oh, huh. But, but it's just so, <laughs> it's so informative. And, right. and yeah, I do think at least for me, that would be as a student, looking back at my student life, that would be something that, um, I would never want to like take away or like mm. short sight if that makes sense for any any student i would i think that's really important yeah Yeah. i I mean i think some of our audience too might be people that might be interested in animation or maybe they're students of animation is there anything that like like from their perspective 
maybe if you look at it from the lens of someone that's just a student or just maybe interested in animation and they're wondering if this is right for me like is there any like is there any advice or things that uh, might be helpful that you've learned looking back now and you're like oh like I wish I could um, yeah and I, I think for me it's not really like an advice that someone just explicitly told me mm. Um, well, I have two. I have one that's, that's always in the back of my head now, more right. recently. And then I just read something the other day on social media that I was like, oh, wow, that's really great advice. And I'm huh. going to repeat those two. Um, first one is just to really be authentic. And mm. that is so hard. Even if you think you are being authentic, there's still a lot of like social conditioning that's happening with mm. your art. And I didn't know it until I like later went into the industry. You actually really have to consciously fight for your authenticity mm. as opposed to just being like, no, I, I like this. I'm authentic, you know. Mm. So what do you mean by authenticity? Like, what does that word oh, man, mean to you? Question. <laughs> oh, how would I define? I think something that is truly unapologetically purely you, mm. like something that is really, really, truly you and unadulterated by other people's opinions. Mm. I think there's a good way to take in feedback or outside influences and channel that into something that feels authentic for you. Mm. But there's also, it's a fine line between at a certain point, you're sometimes just doing art to get a reaction or to please someone, mm. which for some artists that that is their main goal and that's totally valid. Everyone's gonna have different priorities and their art life, but um, I think that's what I mean by authentic. Uh, I, I wanna get to the other quote, the other oh, yeah, advice yeah. that uh -huh. I thought was really, really cool before I, cause I wanna ask you the same question. But the, I, I read um, a James Baldwin quote. Yeah, that, he's awesome. Yeah, that said something like, I'm totally gonna screw it up, but it was something like, write us to write good write a sentence that is as clean as a bone or something mm. it was something like that um and we can find the actual code and maybe we can post it somewhere but it was just like wow that's mm. it like mm. and and i know he was talking about writing but it i think it's the same with drawing too like right. draw something that just so cleanly purely communicates whether it be a really specific thing or even if it's an abstract feeling just mm. still clear, clearly clearly communicates that okay what about you Shun? that's what? beautiful oh thank you oh sorry. so poetic um <laughs> what what is one advice as an artist that really stuck with you and also what one advice would you really like give someone like a new animation student, oh, yeah. like the one advice um <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like no one really said this exact sentence, but um, I thought I had a really great teacher uh, when I was in high school. Uh, he taught this, this guy named Larry Konarski. Uh, he had mm. a very interesting. He was very. So, he was very different from the other teachers in my high school. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, like going back to the bouncing ball thing, he <laughs> would. Uh, there was no Eric. Goldberg book or you know there's not these books that tell you how to do the bouncing ball with the charts and everything um, mm. he, he would just get like he would start the class with like an actual ball and then he would just drop it and then, and then he would go okay well, what just happened like what wow. you, like and then you would just have to ask questions and um, kind of have a, have your own opinion about it almost it was mm -hmm. kind of like a he wasn't gonna give you the answer just like the some kind of formula i love that that's amazing. and i feel like that's now we're in this age of like there's so much stuff on the internet like on right. pinterest instagram everyone's doing a tutorial there it's right. all great it's a lot of information in there mm -hmm. but in some ways it's like I, I kind of retained the information when I, I've really gone the length of trying yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. And I, no, for, that for me, it's like, oh, you just want to know it. Like, I think, I think that's important for me to mm -hmm. like, know 
whatever it is i'm trying to figure out like to really when someone goes oh do you know animation and then to really say with confidence oh i know it i know this yeah. at least i know this and what like what does that sentence means mean just by sim- simply saying i know this that you've gone the length of really <laughs> going deep and then trying to figure it out on your own i think yeah that nope. might be helpful for students when they're you know um uh because for me i i'll just i'll just try to really look at every different like lane to figure it out on my own and uh maybe that might be helpful for students too when they're like learning learning something uh no i think that's so incredibly (laughs) valuable because yeah no you're you're absolutely right because when you look at some internet tutorial especially like let's say like how to draw a hand by some other artist Again, totally valid, and I think um, people can find um, solutions to a lot of like hand drawing, uh, hand drawing, right. uh, problem solving <laughs> uh, with those things. But also, what you also have to recognize is that you're looking at you're looking at a solution that has already been filtered once through someone else's perspective. Right. Right. You're not looking at the actual hand right. and and actually getting your, extracting your pure perspective of who, right. how you as an individual see it, right. but you're actually getting someone else's perspective of how they see the hand, right. and then you're taking their answers and incorporating in your own. Again, there's nothing wrong with it, right? Yeah. There's, and, and all, I mean, who doesn't, who isn't influenced by, you know, another artist? But at the same time, when we diminish the importance of actually looking at the truthful thing in real life and right. getting to have our own authentic, <laughs> pure interaction with it, then we are kind of losing something too. So I think it's a balance, but right. I don't know. Is that kind of what you were thinking as well? Or That's beautiful. Wow. Oh, oh thank you. Exactly <laughs> thank you so much. No, I, I do. Yeah. So I, I think it, this is just me. Gonna, this, the whole podcast is going to be me saying this is beautiful. That's no, no, it's, no, <laughs> no. The whole podcast is going to be me just being so inspired by what you say and just like adding, <laughs> trying to add as much. Hi, guys. Hope you enjoyed our first episode. Thanks for listening this far. Um, we just want to also say that we want to hear from you. Uh, you can send us questions at Mingyu and Shiyun at gmail.com. Uh, also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, we also have a YouTube account, and you can subscribe to us at iTunes. Um, all those links are in the descriptions for this. Uh, we also wanted to thank uh, our producer, Andy Lee, and our editor, Charles Jones, for all their hard work behind the scenes. Thank you, Andy and Charles. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, it's going to be a great... Uh, the second episode is going to be awesome. We yeah, have we s- have some amazing guests lined up. So, you know, um, please send us your questions and anything that you guys want us to talk about. You know, it can be even in long form. Not too long because we have to... But, um, you know, you never know who might answer your questions in the future. So... 